and welcome to Clamp, the weekly podcast where we talk about all things related to creating, living, and making projects. I'm your host, Grant Alexander, and joining me as always is Morley Kurt and Adam Mackey. And today's topic, I was listening to Morley's other podcast, Into the Spotlight, a few weeks ago, and he was talking a lot about ideas uh, with with his co-host, Ryan. And he was talking a lot about like how he doesn't like to be corrupted. And he kept saying the word uh, corrupted and I, or corruption of his, I don't know, whatever it was. And I kept going, I want you to dive into that deeper. And so I listened to the whole episode and I didn't feel like I got enough of conversation because he wasn't able to answer me because it was a recorded podcast. (laughs) So I went, well, you know what? I I have a conversation with this guy all the time. So let's have an episode where I can dig a little deeper on what he means by corruption of his ideas. So Mm -hmm. take it away, Morley. Yeah, I think um, what I mean when I say like corruption of an idea is – a lot of times when I go into a project, I have like a picture in my mind and that picture comes from like innumerable sources, like all the things you're inspired by in your life. Mm-hmm. And the thing that I actually want to make likely already exists in some finished form, but the inspirations that come to it are from a whole bunch of things unrelated to that thing. And when it's a more sort of like artistic piece or I have the function figured out or the function maybe isn't super complicated, I don't like to research pictures of the finished product and see how other people have done it. Um, Because I don't want to, at that point, have other people's ideas maybe change what I originally had in my head. And you know, I'm not married to that restriction. Like it's an ongoing process. But a funny story is when I, last week when I did the 3D printed fix for my car, um, like before I made that video, I didn't actually know what the problem was. I didn't know like how the stoppers worked with the glove compartment. Like what I did on camera was really the first time I'd even looked at it and saw like, oh, there's little slots here where stoppers go in. But as I was like filming that and and sort of rooting around my car, I actually found on the floor what I assume to be the broken <laughs> stopper. Right. I don't know, because this has been a problem for like months. I don't know how it is like still on the floor. Like I vacuumed my car multiple times since then, but I'm pretty sure that's what it was. And I consciously avoided looking at it for too long because I didn't want, because I already had an idea of like how I wanted to make it at that point. And I didn't want to copy the solution that they had made. I wanted to sort of like do my own solution. Um, right. So it's, when you talk about corruption, it has nothing to do with whether or not it would be the best solution in the world. It has to do with being the solution, the finished product, the video, the whatever you're working on. It has to do with it matching what your initial idea was. I guess so. And and again, like, I don't know if it's really like the best way to go about it. Um, I think it's also like, I wouldn't agree with the fact that just viewing someone else's or viewing a variety of others would bring you to the best solution. Like I, in the past, like when I was getting into leather work, there's a lot of great leather working pictures on Pinterest and I'd scroll through Pinterest and there's so much content on there, like pictures of stuff. And I found that like the more I scrolled and the more awesome stuff I see, I saw it sort of just kind of like paralyzed me or would like not really like motivate me in a way. Like it was just all these like beautiful pictures of finished things that all sort of blur together. Right. Whereas the, my favorite things that I've actually made leather work wise were like more inspired by one or two like specific things that I may have seen in passing or had like direct experience with. Um, like when I was making the fold down table, for example, like that, you know, was very functional. I was like, okay, how have other people done that? And how can I do it in my own space? And, and for that, it was like, I wanted the functional thing more than I wanted the most original solution in the world. So, okay. So it's, it may not be about, so it's more about art and less about function is where you feel like you can be corrupted. I guess so. Yeah. I, I think that's, 
that's pretty accurate. But I think the from the flip side of it, the inspiration side of it is like, I think I draw inspiration from many like non maker sources. And I like tapping into those things that are sort of unrelated to the finished product that I'm making. And so, you know, rather than listen to like all the maker podcasts, I listen to like some of the maker podcasts and then I listen to a lot of music and try to like spend a lot of time just like quiet with my thoughts because for me that just, it sits better. It, like it makes me more motivated um, than filling my ears constantly with people who are doing something similar to what I'm doing. Um, I don't know. It's, it's all an ongoing process. It's just, just kind of like how I like to work. Totally. It makes, I, I don't want to come across as like, I think you're doing it wrong. I'm trying to delve deeper into the why you're doing it. So maybe other people can learn mm -hmm. uh, how to not get their ideas corrupted because I think some of it is totally, I felt it, right? I felt like I've looked at too many things and now I can't do the thing I wanted. Mm -hmm. And I go back and I remember times where I would just do something and just see if it worked. Yeah. That's a big part of it. Like, the, we, we've all been in that like beginner's mindset where like you do, you make the thing before you know how complicated it is. And then once you know, it's a lot harder to do. And so I think a lot of times we're trying to like tap back into that sort of like innocent creative mindset. Right. See, so I get sometimes in there and I, I get into myself and, and the problem I come up with is like some things need dimensions, like a chair needs a certain dimension. If I'm trying to make a chair for myself, I can pretend to sit down. I can look at another chair I'm sitting in and measure it off of it. But if I'm making like a chair for a kid, I need to go and look at a bunch of different chairs, look at diagrams. Well, how big are they? How tall are they? What does, how does it work? And then that's where I get paralyzed. And maybe that's mm -hmm. where I feel like, I don't know if like corruption is the right word, but I feel like I liked paralyzed better because, but I, I know I've got, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've made like my first big woodworking project was a chair. So it, the first one I did in high school, actually, like I lie, I have made it my high school. Uh, my yeah. final project for high school was an outdoor setting, like yeah. chair lounge and stuff, but it terrifies me. It's funny that you say that like those dimensions are the thing that stops you. Cause once I have those dimensions, I'm like, awesome. I can do whatever I want within this box and it's like, great, as long as right. the seat is 15 inches high, as long as the table hot top is 29 and a half inches high, everything else is whatever I want to do. So I feel like that frees me more than paralyzes me. I would agree if they were like standard, standard. They're like ranges uh, and and reasons and then this is not, not this. And it's like 17 people have told me why I can't do it this way. And 17 other people have told me why this exact number is the only thing that matters. And mm -hmm. I just go like, Oh God. Hey, and that also sounds like a bit of like perfectionism. Whereas like maybe the best thing to do is accept that your chair won't be perfect. And the next one you'll learn from it. And we talked about this, well, a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about making knives and stuff from, from springs and stuff, like All right. you make it how you want to make it with whatever material you want. And the people that are perfectionists are going to say, that's the wrong material you've done. It all depends on why you're making it and whether or not, exactly. Like, if you want to make it for the process, which is what my first, like the Adirondack chairs that I have in my backyard, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted the process. And then I wanted to make a scaled down one. So the scaled down one was a whole like taking the plans and scaling them down. What's the process? And I was wanted to do it. If I make another chair, it's not for learning the process. It's, it's to have taken my inspirations, my ideas and everything and putting it out into the world. And I only want to make one. I don't want to become a chair builder. And I think this may be something that's wrong with like my, my generalistic approach to things is that I'm worried about if I make a leather harmonica case, I'm only going to be making one. So I don't want to make a yeah. shitty one. But right? you got to make the shitty stuff to get to the good stuff. Like I think it's, it's unrealistic to assume that you can just make an awesome chair on your first try. Like you have to, you have to make some crappy ones before 
you can make a great one. Yeah. I, I think you need to learn to be happy with a crappy one. Like, yeah, okay, it's not perfect, but that's the point of something being handmade is that it's not perfect and you can say, well, yeah, it's okay. Maybe there's right. a problem here, but I made it. I, this isn't- I, we've, I, I think we're kind of getting a little off on the – on, and I've I've gotten us there. Is we're getting a little off on that. Like, subjects. <laughs> yeah, we we were not talking about inspiration and corruption anymore. So, like you were talking about you, Morley. We're talking about how you listen to music as part of your creative process, and you also talked about not wanting to be corrupted while you're in your creative process. And I wondered, it seemed like inspiration was something that is positive. And if you didn't think it was positive, then it was corrupting your idea. But you say that music inspires you and takes you in different directions on things, but then you also have no problem with it affecting your creative process. Or maybe you subconsciously have never put the two together. It's interesting. Yeah, I don't um <clears throat> I don't know if I would ever have described it in those words. I think when I think about an idea being corrupted it doesn't really have much to do with feeling like creative. It's more literal in that like I have a ch- I have like a a funky modern chair that I want to make out of bent lamination. And so when I have those ideas I don't want to research specifically bent lamination chairs because I don't want to copy someone else's bent lamination chair. I might research, like you said, chair dimensions and like chair shapes and maybe look at the chairs around my house and then from those things make a bent lamination chair. Right. Okay. But you say that everything around you inspires you. Mm Mm-hmm. So I guess how formed is your idea and how, like, when is corruption corruption? When does your idea stop being the thing that you started with and start going in a different direction? Because if everything around you is always uh, inspiring you, then there's a good chance that something you're, you're seeing along the way is sending you down a different path. Or are you so steadfast in the way that you're building something that you're in, in your, like, grip to your original idea because you've talked about that before getting caught up in the idea and worried like your geodesic dome that was a you know fail because you kind of got caught up in in this idea and stopped thinking um but were you still being inspired by all the things around you or had you shut your mind down no i wouldn't say i i shut my mind down in the process at all like i i totally think that my creative process evolves as the project goes on like usually the whole flavor of something changes while I'm working with it. And I think that's great. Mm-hmm. And I, I actually wouldn't even say that I usually get attached to the original idea. I think what happened with the geodesic dome was more that I sort of like lost sight about what was interesting about the project and just kind of got a little distracted, I would say, or, or like not even distracted as in like, oh, a bird flew away and I'm going to look at that little thing. But it was just like, I lost sight about what was interesting at that about that project as a whole. And that's why I've started, I've tried to be a little more diligent about like journaling about my projects because I want to be able to look back and see like how an idea has evolved and right. not keep it all in my head. I think that's, that'll be, that's a really good thing. I think that'll help prevent your ideas from being corrupted. If that is, you know, something that can really happen. Like, because I think if you have the original thought, you can go back to it. Mm-hmm. Um, as long as you're organized with your thoughts, I'm not, I have them literally everywhere. Like I was cleaning out a desk and I found like three different versions of the cabinets that I recently made or the dress, the closet organizer thing that I recently made. I found like three different hand-drawn versions of that that yeah. had been lost to time. Right? Like, I don't know. So I think when when Ryan and I were talking about, you know, corruption of ideas, one of the things we were speaking specifically about was like, when do you start talking to other people about your idea? Like, when do you feel ready to start doing that? 
And that was like a, a very real question I had for him because a lot of times I feel like I don't want to talk about it to other people until it's like established enough in my own head or it's or it's even partially built. And I think I was I felt very validated that he said similarly about that same thing. And like, you know, in the Discord, people will post like thumbnail ideas from time to time. And I've done that as well. But 90% of the time, like I don't want anyone's input until I'm like very near the end until it's like, you know, you've looked at something for long enough that you can't tell the difference between two things. Cause I want that vision. I don't want to start feeling like bad about a certain idea I have because maybe like the good idea hasn't even come yet. Maybe I have to keep working through it on my own to sort of like get to the next version of it. Okay. And I, understand because i do that a lot too but what if the other people especially when you've gotten to a certain point they make it better i agree other people can definitely make your ideas better um and that's also like something i'm trying to get better at myself is like is using other people's input strategically but i think other people also like everyone has an opinion right, right. my eden's uh eden's brother and his wife are getting married and they've decided that they want everyone in the family to try the cake. And then they're going to make the decision about which cake they're going to go with. So they want all these bakeries and they get pieces of cake wow. to try. And it's great because we go over and they have cake for us to try. <laughs> but I would never do that if it were my wedding because every single That's person insane. has an opinion about which cake they think is best. And if you take everyone's input into account, you're never going to reach a decision. Or, I mean, you might, but it's just going to take way longer than is necessary. Like everyone has an opinion all the time and not everyone's opinion is equal. Right. Are they just getting everyone to say like, this is the one I like. And then when everyone gets the most votes, they pick. Or? No, we have like full on discussions about it. It's so inefficient. Wow. Okay. <laughs> you know what? I love that because it's not a, it's about the process. It is like, they have developed a little like fun way of hanging out with their family and having something to talk about. And it's all part of their wedding. Sure. And it's amazing. Uh, I mean, being in this situation, I disagree because there's so many aspects that go into planning of a wedding. And like, if it were me planning my wedding, like I trust my own taste in cake. I'm going to get the cake that Eden and I like, and it right. will be yeah. delicious. That's the point. But everyone has a different opinion about these cakes. And it's like, at a certain point, I wouldn't care about those people's opinions because- the cake I choose will be delicious. It may not have been right. the cake that you ch you chose, but you never even knew that that option existed. Do you think that that's really why they're doing it? Do you think that they're like paralyzed in making a decision and they need everyone's input? Or do you think that they're doing it to extend this thing, to have everyone included and involved and, and be part of this joyous moment in their life? Because that's how I see it. And now I don't know if you're there and like arguing like, ah, this cake's better. Chocolate is the only way and vanilla sucks. Or if you guys are just having a normal conversation about the taste profile of different cakes and why you like certain ones better. We're because having could, a normal I, conversation about it. But okay. I mean, it's a wedding, especially a large wedding. There's so many aspects that go into it. And I think you're right. Like they are doing it because they want to spend time with the family and they want everyone to hang out and be ha not just like to have the best cake possible, but you're right. Like to have those fun, you know, interactions. I'm just saying for my own wedding, it's not what I'm going to do. Oh, I wouldn't do it for my wedding either. There's zero people got any, cho I'm surprised I got my wife along. To, uh... <laughs> I I'd laugh if they did all that and then just bought completely different cakes that no one ever tried, but oh, no. I feel Duncan like a cake. <laughs> They just do it. They're just doing it to get like the family together. But I, I think a cake is like not that big of a deal for a wedding. Like the the look of the cake, yeah, but like the the flavor. But like it's not like you're choosing the flower arrangements and all that sort of stuff. Where like like girls have like their dream of what they want their wedding to look like or whatever. Like you're not really changing the look of the wedding. You're just choosing the inside. That makes sense. Yeah. I don't I, I get what you're saying. You feel like you wouldn't be able to do that because because your idea in your head is so clear you don't need other people's input. Yes. Yeah, I trust my own yeah. taste in cakes and 
everyone else can enjoy the delicious cake that I choose. Right. Now, and I agree, there is like, this is such a low stakes nothing. Like the <laughs> cake at your wedding is a nothing. And that's why I think you're like uh, dumbfounded by the decision to have everyone inv involved because it doesn't matter. It's cake right. one day, right? Mm -hmm. And if you don't like it, you take a bite and then you, you didn't pay. I like, don't know, man. I've heard my parents have been to some weddings where the cake was bad and they've talked about it for years. <laughs> well, I mean, your parents must not have a very exciting life. I mean, uh, it's, it's in the context of like, they, they're, they're surrounded by many weddings right now. So like, it's the example they keep coming back to. I, I feel like I don't really get corrupted by looking at like different things, but more of people's input, which I think is where the cake sort of comes into it. Right. Is that like, so say so from when I was building this TARDIS, I kept messaging like the group, our um, discord and, and asking opinions on what I should do here and here. And every time I got opinions, I just went back to what I was originally going to do. Like I, I asked for help and then I'm like, no, this is too much overload like too much corruption like i'm just gonna go back to what i was originally gonna do it was just overwhelming mm -hmm. right i mean that also depends on you being able to fully articulate your vision to someone else like if you can't explain to yeah. someone else or e express to them like what you're thinking then it's almost like a moot point like th that happens a lot when i'm editing a video and a lot of times eden will like ask if she, if she can see part of it and like sometimes i'll show her the very beginning but I'm, i'll like try to explain like what i'm going for i'm like I'll just show yeah. you when it's done. Well, that's like that's like everything I make with my wife. She like she'll come in halfway through, and I'm like, just wait until I'm finished. Don't judge it now. Wait until I'm finished. You don't see, like she can't see the final picture like I can. Well, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I I get asking. I think the I think if you don't want to be corrupted, you have to have a select people that you that you can Trust. talk to. In trust, and it's not even just trust. It's beyond. It's different than trust. Because I trust my wife, but I don't ask her opinion no, I, on all these stuff. But I, that's what, that's what I don't don't trust. Like, don't trust a person. Trust the, the their opinion. Like that, you trust that they are on the same wavelength as you. Right. That, that you can have an actual conversation about the idea. Right. Yeah. And you can bring them in, and you can say, "This is what I'm going for. This is why I'm going for it." This is where I need your help. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people do not listen to that last bit. And you say, okay, I have this, this, this all figured out. I just don't understand how this part works. And they mm -hmm. try and tell you why yeah. the other parts are shit. Or yep. why you could have done the other parts better. And you just go, I didn't ask you about any of that. Can you go back and look at my <laughs> goddamn question? And I think yeah. it happens all the time for me. And maybe I'm just very, very bad at Same explaining no. things. Same for me. Or no one reads it happens at work it happens in the discord it happens everywhere and i just go like i i don't need you to like i need to explain enough of my idea so people understand what's going on and i don't want you to comment on any of that right yeah 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 it's tough i i think um that's why like artists treasure collaborative relationships so much and try to like keep them going because it's like you if right. you have someone that you feel safe like communicating with and you know that they're going to like build you up and not and focus on the right things like that's huge totally you know and i, I think it kind of was thinking about when we were talking i think it was in the after show with bob and he was talking about collaborations with other people he's like because i'm a generalist i can't collaborate with anyone and i think the problem is he has his own creative process and he doesn't want to corrupt it yeah right that's where i think I go like, I don't know. Yeah. Now that, I, so now that we have this conversation a little more about it, I can see where you were coming from. When I, when you were talking about it so much, I was like, it just sounds very pretentious. <laughs> the way that it came across, I was just like, stop being so pretentious, Morley. Like you can talk to other people about your ideas, but I see what you're saying. You're, you're saying like, I, I'm going to put it to a committee of people who don't understand what I'm going for. And they're going to come back to me with things that don't matter to me. They're going to tell me yeah. all about the cake profile, uh, you know, and I don't care. <laughs> I'm picking my cake. They're trying to get involved in my cake picking process. <laughs> and I'm not wanting Help me them. pick it. 
Help me pick a right. flavor of cake. Yeah, but if you move this part of the cake here, it would look... Right. No, tell me pick the inside, the fucking flavor. <laughs> no, but I mean... No, that, no, I, worse. I, I, they'll I, tell you about I mean, the flowers, and they'll yeah, tell you about yeah. why the, the dining arrangement needs to be six people in circles and not four peoples in squares or something, and you're just like... Oh, that's circles over long tables all day. But that aside... Um, I mean, I fully also accept that, like, I have some growing to do in taking constructive criticism and, like, seeking out information. So, like, you know, the things that I set on Into the Spotlight, I'm not going to, like, die on that hill. That was a moment in time. And maybe the things I was saying were, you know, out of touch or, you know, unduly pretentious. I, yeah, no, it's more... It's like everything. If you if you didn't have the chance to explain yourself and people didn't have the chance to ask questions to clarify, then they can come across a different way than what you're intending. Mm -hmm. Everyone's going to say think, everything different. Of course. So um, going back a little bit about the creative process, because I think that's where – like I don't know if an idea can be corrupted – but I think the creative process is what can be corrupted. Maybe the idea can be as well. What do you think about that? Yeah. I mean, I think especially in something like making videos where it is so process driven, like because of video, making a video takes such a long amount of time. The final product is going to take shape way more in that process than it does just from like a spark of an idea. And I think about, um, you know, if I'm making videos for the steam project, like I'm not going to check in with the director after I have like two minutes done. You need to get it to a certain point where you can yeah. actually like show them, this is what I have in my head. And that has been like an interesting experience working with other people on videos is, is knowing when that point is and not bringing them in too early. Cause like, you don't want to, if your video is too early, even if it's like fully edited and chopped up, but maybe like the B rolls and in the right spots or whatever else, it's just bad. And it's like, <laughs> the comments are going to be like, well, it's not finished. You know, right. you need to add more things. I mean, it's still nice to get feedback, but like you can only do so many rounds of revisions. Right. I, I remember one time I sent uh, a video to Andrew Zito for like a, a little like feedback session. And I had put in like insert whatever clip here, right? Insert like final clip here, insert using it here. Right, because I just didn't have those clips yet. I had everything else done except for like the final reveal. I was like, you know, and he's like, you should probably put like his first comment was like, you're not going to leave those in the video, are you? And I was like, well, obviously, <laughs> those were notes for myself. <laughs> Anyways, I, I, I put the notes in there so that I wouldn't get questions about it. But obviously, when he, you know he watched the video, it was, his question was like, that's not what's going to be in there. And I was like, no, no. Yeah, it's kind of like in engineering. Like if you're, if you're doing a calculation and you're just like, well, you know, assume ideal conditions, assume steady state behavior. Like you right. can't, you can't just assume everything's going to go great. You have to actually do the work sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I, I, the other thing I was thinking is, would you be happy in your YouTube career if somebody took over doing all your thumbnails and editing? Right, so you shot it, you told them what you wanted, everything, but they took over and they didn't like they you had some creative input into thumbnails, but like what you said and what your ideas may not be the best, and they're like you know an expert in YouTube we'll just stick with thumbnails expert YouTube thumbnail maker guarantees your c t r will double yes but honestly everything... if it, if it means my channel is gonna take off, then yeah I, I'd probably go with that. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, so I, don't have, like, where... a success, I don't have a successful channel right now. So like if someone's going to help me, sure, go for it. I'd love it. No, not, it, not even the successful channel. If someone wanted to take over making my thumbnails, I'd be happy. Editing? No. I want to edit. I want – that's what I, I enjoy editing. I will always edit my own videos no matter how big I get. It's the, the filming and the thumbnails and all the social media side is what I don't enjoy. It's just a lot of work that I don't know what I'm doing. And right. I don't know how to learn to do better. Whereas like editing, I can learn to do better. I know how to. Okay. Morley editing. Would you let someone else edit? You don't get final cut either. Um, even big YouTubers get final cut. 
Yeah, but um, this is a hypothetical situation. <laughs> I know. It's funny because, like, I like the editing. It, it's probably part of the process that, like, I get most into a flow state with. And, oh, like, mm -hmm. when I was doing the a video every day thing, <clears throat> by, like, day two or three, and it was starting to, like, bleed into nighttime a little bit, I wasn't dreading the editing. Dreading the editing. I would just, like, sit down and be like, all right, next three, four hours, this is this is what I'm doing, and it's going to be chill. And I just kind of, like, get into it. You know, no thoughts of like anxiety or I'm not enjoying what I'm doing right now. Unless sometimes I notice that like if I really don't like the video, that's when I don't like editing is like this isn't looking the way I I, I want it right. to. But if if the vision is sort of like coming through and I'm liking what I'm making, then it's an awesome process. So in my leather harmonica case, I was enjoying the editing until I got to a spot where I'd done something and I'd completely covered what I was doing with my hands. And I was like, I don't even know if I can finish this video. And it was like 90% edited. Right. And I just cut, I would cut, I was cutting something and I completely like didn't have a shot of that. And I went like, what am I going to do here? And so yeah. I like fudge two clips together to make it look like it. And no one notices because no one really pays attention to my videos that much. But like, I kind of went like at that point, I just went like, I didn't enjoy it. And that, and like, it took like a couple hours of just not editing to get back into it. But I was having a great time until then, until like, I, so this, I don't, is that like me being corrupted? But anyways, that doesn't, we've kind of tangent to out of here. Do, would you, give up creative control of your editing and no final say on your cuts would that still it's not about whether or not you like it it's they guarantee you will get more views yeah again like the magnitude of that would would be a factor like is it enough views to make my channel become a sustainable income then yes because that would free me up to you know focus on developing new projects and, and focusing on other things. Cause it's like, if, you, if you're doing everything, you're probably not doing everything as well as you could. So if I could be freed up right. to focus more on like the, doing the the cool projects and learning new skills, then yeah, that, that sounds pretty good. Okay. See, I, I don't, for me, I don't think I would because the, I feel like that would be the max corruption mm -hmm. and the like, I don't know. It would be like, I know I could make my thumbnails better and I know there are ways I could get more clicks and I could make better videos if I did X, Y, and Z, but they're not my vision, mm -hmm. right? I'll often put in a thumbnail that I know is like, I don't like the thumbnail, but I think it might have better click through rate. And even if it has a better CTR, I'll, I'll change it later unless the video really blows up. But if it's like a 6% CTR and the other one's seven, and the six is the one I like. It's the nicer looking picture. I go back to the six, even though it's a worse. It's this worse for me. It's a worse overall decision other than I like this one better. So I don't think I could give it up, but I completely get my goal on my channel is not the goal that you have. Right. Exactly. Yeah. The, the, my end goal, I don't, I don't care about exploding on YouTube. I, I enjoy the process of it. Right. I'm doing it for the fun. Don't get me wrong. I'd love to <laughs> explode and become a big I mean, YouTuber. In saying I'm that, not, I don't know if I would. Yeah. I think that there's some interesting framing of things going on, I think, right now. And that I, I have – exploding would be great. All I'm saying is a sustainable income. But to make a sustainable income as a YouTube content creator, like you need pretty big numbers, to be uh -huh. quite honest. Um yeah, it's a it's a tough field to be sure. Totally. Well, so you're okay with corruption as long as it you get the money. So you're just like I'm okay with selling out. Yeah, sell out. Make that. I'm I'm ready to be an underwear model. Come All on, right. me undies. I'm in. <laughs> All right. I think you'll need a haircut. Uh, <laughs> nah, I got. I'm trying to get the whole Jon Snow thing going on. I just need, give me another year. Okay, sounds good. Well. Uh, here at uh, Clamp, we don't need to sell out because we have such amazing supporters. 
So I want to take a th- second to thank our Patreon supporters, especially the F Clamp level, which is our highest level over there on Patreon. We got Brent Jarvis from Clean Cut Woodworking, Vincent Ferrari from the Because We Make podcast, and Austin from High Caliber Craftsman. Um, so go check those people out because they support us. They're amazing people. If you want to join Patreon and uh, be part of that, uh, you can go on to patreon.com slash clamp. What you'll get beyond just supporting us and making it so that we don't have to read MeUndies, uh, you know, s- s- spots in the middle of this podcast. You'll also get access to a pre-show and after show, as well as a handmade keychain that's numbered, a numbered handmade keychain. There's only one of them that exists except for the one that went to Greg because he got the mail yeah, token. He's probably going to get it. bandit or customs officer more likely um has that other kitchen <laughs> right so that's what you get um as well as our undying love uh so thank you so the, so much for that if you can't do that we completely understand what we would really appreciate if you share the show you know if you have two friends that like this and they tell two friends and there's a whole pyramid scheme we would love the pyramid scheme it would make us grow um and with that, recommendations. All right. I wanted to shout out Maker's Waffle. Um, so like I mentioned last week, their episode with Jesse Ueda, I think would go up there as like one of the best podcast episodes I've listened to. Um, but aside from that episode, I really like how they've, I don't know if this was their intention necessarily, but I feel like they've become like a Maker's Variety Show especially because they do like the YouTube live thing every week at the same time. It's almost like it's the tonight show and you can tune in every week, which I don't know. I don't know if I would have expected that something that I would think was really cool. Um, But yeah, it's uh, sorry. Abby's barking in the background and I can't mute myself because I'm talking. No. Um, (laughs) Yeah. I think they're, you know, Jamie and Andy are both like very eloquent they take the time to like look into their guests and they, they do good research. Um, they're very empathetic and they have like a very casual but engaging vibe to them. I was also just listening to the episode with Anne of All Trades, which I was also enjoying muchly. Um, yeah, I hope it continues to go well for them. I think they had Ooh. the back-to-back records. It was the longest show followed by the shortest show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And it's funny that like over an hour is their shortest show. Yeah. Yeah. If, be prepared. Their, their episodes go for like four to five hours. I picture like they um, just spend all week like prepping like an athlete before a big game for those sessions. <laughs> like I'm not going to sit at all this week until that episode comes around. They don't drink any water through it the whole time. Like the whole day, no water. So to make sure that they don't have to go to the bathroom during the five hour session. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my clip mandation this week is going to be a video by Jesper makes. He made a coffee table from pallet blocks and resin. Mm. And it was, just, it was interesting. Like, so all like when you pull a pallet apart, you got all the little blocks that are in between like the two layers and you made a table out of that. It was just really cool to see. And it was very interesting to see how strong wood glue is. Like he grew, he glued up a row of these blocks and like was hitting it on the table and it would not break. Yeah, wood, wood glue is stronger than uh, than the wood itself. That's why they suggest you don't yeah. put it through planers too much. Yeah, and then we all come along and make cutting boards and put it through planers. Wow. Well, yeah. So, yeah. Anyways, the uh, <laughs> yeah looks cool. Uh, my recommendation is also a YouTube video. It's from Andrew Richard Makes. He turned some junk into a cool wall sconce. Um, it's an old headlight from a 1920s car, a uh, like egg beater drill, and those two things combined with other parts make a tilting uh, wall sconce, which I thought was really cool. And Andrew Richard Mike's is making some really cool stuff and he has like 38 subscribers. So everyone should go over there and subscribe to him, check him out. Um, yeah, this, it was a really neat thing. So definitely go it check him out. It was really cool. I just subscribed. It's so there cool. There you go. Now he's at 39. Is that 30. 41? 
Oh, wow. That though, these have been taken off since this cool junk inspired uh, thing. Yeah. Well, since we don't have a review this week, which by the way, if you want to support us another way, you could uh, submit a review to Apple Podcasts or Podcast Addict or anywhere else that accepts reviews or just give us a rating over on the Spotify and send us a review to our inbox. Uh, but instead of reading a review, we're going to be going over to the Adams Australian Word of the Week. Yeah, well, I'm I'm actually starting to run out, so some reviews would be really good. <laughs> I've probably got maybe a good ten left, and then and then this uh, this is going to be done. Can but we need a new segment. My word for this week, yeah, my word for this week is going to be Smoko. Smoko. Oh, like a really Smoko. hot girl. No, S M O K O. See, I'd say I, have like- a, I have a funny story behind this word as well. Okay. I would say it's like you're going, you, you're just like you're hot box in your car. You're going to go have a smoko. No. So a smoko is your break from work. So okay. usually yeah. like tradies and stuff. So yeah. So I remember the first time I was ever a tradie and I was working on this site and the boss goes, Oh, do you want to go for smoko? And I'm like, Oh, I don't smoke. And everyone just lost their shit at me and was laughing at me. And I'm like, I was so confused and then I realized like, yeah. So it's, it's literally just like you break to like have a smoke and, and that. Like you don't have to have a smoke, just even just having your lunch. Yeah, that was like the uh, yeah. construction site I worked at in Boston. They called their first break coffee. And uh, like most people would just eat lunch then because they had been there for four hours already. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> All right. Well, that was actually a good one. Thank you for 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 enlightening us. Always the tone. Uh, of I was I was trying to I was trying to find a slang word for corrupt, but I can't find one. So, huh. other other than other than poly, poly, yeah, politician. Wow, well, I wouldn't have got that one. See, yeah, I wouldn't even got the word for politician. That was apparently a slang. <laughs> um, yeah. Well. Thank you for that. Uh, I want to also thank TF Turning for our theme song. And uh, you can find us all at all the usual social media places, including Clampstagram, ClampTube, and ClampBitter, um, ClampBook, if you're uh, so inclined. No, uh, no Clamp Talk. No, no, we're not on Clamp Talk. We're not on the Clamp Clampler. Um, I don't know. We're the not what? on Truth Clamp. Or uh, any of those other fun ones. Anyways, I don't know where I'm going with this. On that note, <laughs> see you guys later. My, my ideas were Bye. corrupted. Goodbye. Bye.